Good morning, everyone. And it a beautiful morning. Um, I'm here today to kind of uh, lead us through the uh, announcements and introduce our district superintendent today. Uh, one of the first announcements I'm going to make is that we are searching for someone to handle the um, media that Debbie used to handle. Uh, so if anybody's interested, please let Kathy know so that we can get all of the announcements and the order of worship and everything else back up on the screen. The other announcements we have today are to please be in special prayer for Rachel Fowler and her family on the loss of Conrad. Graveside services will be this afternoon at 1 o'clock at Columbiana City Cemetery. And they'll have a drive-by visitation tomorrow from 11.30 to 12.30 at Canterbury United Methodist. And they're going to have a memorial service at 1 o'clock afterwards. And the family asks that you wear masks for all the gatherings. Uh, the other announcement we need to make is that the church office will be closed on Wednesday in observance of Veterans Day. And you are invited to bring fruits and vegetables next week uh, to place in the collection basket we'll have up here at the altar. They will be used to distribute to shut-ins and senior adults in our community for Thanksgiving. We also have in the back Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes um, that are still available for pickup uh, to fill in for this year's project. And they will be due back on Thursday, November the 19th. Anybody else have any other announcements we need to make or that I've left out? All right. Well, I'm here to introduce Rick Owen, our district superintendent, and Rick is going to deliver our sermon today. Uh, Jimmy Acock will be our temporary interim through the end of November. And uh, Jimmy was unable to be here this week, but I believe that Rick is going to tell us a little bit about him, and he will be starting next week. So I hope everyone can help me to welcome Rick as he joins us today. Thank you. It's a privilege to be with you this morning and to be a part of your worship uh, time together, so thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, Jimmy Acock is going to be working with you in the next couple of weeks as, uh, as we move forward to a, a more permanent in, uh, interim for your congregation. Uh, he is a great pastor, great uh, preacher. He has uh, served some of our largest churches in our conference, and I know you will enjoy him being here. He could not be here uh, this Sunday. He had a previous commitment, uh, which is kind of good because he's going to be committed to you uh, for the uh, week uh, for the month of November, and I'm glad that, that he can keep, be here with you. Uh, so look forward to you meeting Jimmy. I know you will enjoy, uh, enjoy him and his preaching and his sharing together with you. Uh, let us go to the Lord for a moment of prayer. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for the power of your presence among us this day. We thank you that even before we prepared to come, you were, you were here drawing us and guiding us to this place so that we might experience the powerful presence of, uh, of you in this marvelous, wonderful day when we celebrate together the Lord's word, the power of, of, of his purpose and meaning for us in making and growing disciples for the transformation of the world. As we worship this day, let us open our hearts and minds and be receptive to your word and your will for our lives. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Morning. In just a moment, uh, uh, we're going to have a very special, uh, special music presented by uh, the praise team. I want to tell you a little bit about, uh, I, I, I go to the 9 o'clock service, the Heart for God service, and about a month ago, uh, the group sang a song that I was unfamiliar with called Free, Amen. And it spoke to me, and I wanted so much to share, to have that shared, that music uh, and message with you all. But I knew a little bit about the logistics of the equipment and uh, set up and everything from the other end of the building all the way over to here. And uh, yet I talked to Mark and Mark immediately accepted. And uh, so we set about the possibility of a, of a date and today's date has 
has been uh, uh, agreed upon and they're here. We just appreciate so much this. Uh, this features Jane uh, Smith on a very lovely solo and I just look forward to them sharing that with you after the uh, Apostles' Creed. And speaking of that, would you stand with me and join in in unison in speaking the Apostles' Creed at this time. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the union of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Falling down like rain, love that I can't explain, peace that stills my soul. Light in the darkest place, life even in the pain, it feels like coming home. Where the Spirit of the Lord is.
Thank you, guys. That was great. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming us here today. There's also a, some special guests that we have here today with us, and, and uh, I want to recognize uh, those persons um, because sometimes, even though we talk about it, we sometimes forget. If you, have, if you are a veteran, would you please stand as you are able? If you're a spouse of a veteran, would you please stand as you're able? Would you all stand to honor these people? Thank you for your service. Thank you for your commitment. You may be seated. And for those that may be watching this uh, either online or uh, later in the week by, by video, we also want to recognize, recognize those persons. Uh, and uh, if you didn't stand, stand for a moment and know that we are remembering you and honoring you this day as well. This week has been an interesting week, has it not? Uh, nobody's going to say amen about that. That's all right. Um, it, is been, it has been a, a, an interesting week. This week, I have to tell you, I was reminded of my high school civics class. Uh, how many of you took high school civics when you were in school? Yeah, I don't know. We, do we do that still? I don't know if we still do that or not. Um, but I was trying to remember all about the Electoral College. I was trying to remember all about all the things about voting. And, all the th it's, and I had this incredible uh, uh, civics teacher uh, who was lots of fun, always had something, <clears throat> something kind of funny to say, and just the nicest guy in the world, until I sat at lunch at, high, at my high school one day with a group of people, uh, and I, I said something about, oh boy, I can't wait till my civics class, and the, uh, two of the people sitting at the class said, why? I said, oh gosh, that's the meanest teacher? Oh my goodness, it's awful. So he always has bad things to say, and, and, and I'm like, what, what, what? I said, I thought it was just had one civics teacher. Said, yeah, but it's just awful. It's just, just, just you know, I just don't like it. Said my grades have gone down in there. And these were these were straight A students. I don't know why they were sitting at my table, but, um, <laughs> but they, you know, they would say, said, yeah, well, gosh, he's just a horrible person. And, and so I was thinking, this is not who I know. I, I'm, how in the world is this? And so a senior sitting behind us because all the juniors had to take the civics class that year. Uh, before you could go on to your senior year, <laughs> the senior behind us leaned over and said, oh, you must have first period. So he always gets up in a bad mood. <laughs> uh, I don't know, maybe it's me or maybe it's uh, just my feelings alone. Maybe you saw it too. But the last several years, it seems like the whole world's been getting up in a bad mood. Uh, just a lot of conflict, a, a lot of kind of... Uh, of, uh, of what I call anti-social media, uh, where it, we, we get on social media. and I, You know, I get on social media for one primary purpose. That's because I have grandchildren. Uh, and I want to see that, that five-month-old and that three-year-old and the other three-year-old in New Jersey and, and the, the five-year-old uh, in, uh, in New Jersey and the, and the other two in Bowling Green so we don't get to see. So I get on this line to see what they've done next. Um, I was a bit shocked last week, <laughs> uh, the week of Halloween, when uh, <clears throat> my daughter sent a picture of my three-year-old standing in a police car with the lights on. Uh, I hope that's not a vision of things to come. Um, uh, but actually, he was having a ball, and the policeman was so nice to kind of be there with him and let him play a little bit in the car. So kind of a neat thing. So that's re but, but even social media has gotten kind of be very negative, very, negative, very uh, you know, gosh, it's just, we just seem to be mad at each other. Um, uh, in, fact, <laughs> in fact, I ran into a guy uh, just the other day uh, coming back from, uh, from Tuscumbia, Alabama. I stopped at exit 304, for those of you that travel 65, uh, and stopped at exit 304 and went in there, uh, and I was buying a cup of coffee, and as I was buy, or actually a, a Diet Coke, buying a Diet Coke, and was about to leave, the guy behind me just started railing on me. I, know, I, <laughs> I, I didn't know what he was talking about. I think I just happened to be the target of the moment. Uh, I'm assuming he got up in a bad mood that morning. Uh, it seems like the world's kind of that way. But you know, in a sense, we've got lots of reasons in 2020 uh, to be kind of in a bad mood, haven't we? We really have. 
I mean, if you think about it, uh, a very contentious political season, no matter which side you were on, you probably didn't get up in bad moves a couple of times this week. Uh, the, the whole idea of COVID-19, and, and uh, we're now in, uh, in months of being uh, isolated and social isolation, individual isolation. Uh, we're, doing, we're wearing masks for the very first time, and we hadn't really thought about doing that that much. Uh, so all, the, all those things are kind of closing in on top of us. Uh, anger, mistrust, betrayal hurt, hatred, all that kind of stuff just kind of comes up, and people get in a bad mood when they're that way. Uh, I have a friend who's an author. Uh, he wrote a book called Rings of Fire, and, and in that book, he talks about the black swan, and he was with us a couple of weeks ago uh, visiting with us, and, and uh, Pat and I were having dinner with him, and, and he's made an offside comment to me. He said, 2020 is the year of the black swan. Uh, and he, a black swan is something that we know can occur, but it's very unusual. It's something that, that, that when we see it, we know that's odd, that's different. It doesn't happen very often. It's just something that's unexpected, and, and all of a sudden it's there, the black swan. And he said 2020 is a black swan year. Uh, and, and it occurs to me that uh, um, he's right. We've had to face things we never thought we'd face before. We've had to think of things that we've never thought about before. We have, we've had things that would put us in a bad mood, if you will, for one reason or another. Uh, in fact, the question can be asked in a black swan world that we live in right now, <clears throat> how should we as followers of Jesus respond? What should we as disciples of Christ, what should we be doing in response to a black swan world that has put us essentially in a bad mood? And so that brings us to the book of Romans. The 12th chapter and the second verse says, that the rest of the world may be different. But you, talking to the church at Rome, said, You be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may know what is the good and perfect will of God. Wow. So when the rest of the world is angry, when the rest of the world is hating, when the rest of the world is upset, when the rest of the world is consumed, by other things that would put them in a bad mood. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Be transformed. Be transformed. Now, Paul just didn't leave it there, because you know, Paul never, <laughs> Paul never knew a letter he didn't want to write more of. I, I just, I'm convinced about that. He was, he was a good letter writer. Uh, uh, being a district superintendent, I get lots of letters. We'll just leave it at that. But... Um, I'm looking for that letter that's going to come and says, we love our pastor. We think he's the most wonderful thing in the world. We, you know, we, want, we want you to find a way for us to give that pastor a right. We, I, I don't get a lot of those, but I get a lot of letters. Well, Paul was writing a lot of letters. And in that letter, uh, he did something marvelous. He said, not just, didn't just say to the, to the people at Rome or the church at Rome, he didn't just say, oh, just be transformed and not tell you how to do it. So he laid out a, a, a strategy for being transformed in the renewing of your mind, so that you might know the good and perfect will of God. He said this. He said, love should be shown without pretending. Uh, some versions of, of the scripture say, uh, <clears throat> let love be genuine. Either another version of the scripture, uh, translated, says, love from the center of, you, of, your, of, of who you are. He said, hate evil and hold on to what is good. Love each other like the members of your family. I want to say that again. Love each other like the members of your family. All members, not that brother-in-law you don't like. Be, <laughs> those that laugh, we don't look at it. Don't look at them. Be, be the best at showing honor to each other. Don't hesitate to be enthusiastic. Be on fire with the Spirit as you serve the Lord. Be happy in your hope and your ground. Uh, be happy in your hope and stand your ground when you're in trouble. And devote yourselves to prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people and welcome strangers into your home. Bless people who harass you. Bless and don't curse them. Be happy with those that are happy. Cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone is equal and don't think that you're better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status. Don't think you're so smart. Don't pay back anyone for evil actions with evil actions, but show respect for what everyone else believes is good. That's the framework of being transformed by the renewal of our minds. 
when the black swan world closes in on top of us, we as Christians are called to love from the center of who we are, to let love be genuine, to not try to be the great, the great somebody, but to be real willing to reach those that are different from us, those whom, with whom we disagree, those with whom we might have been betrayed, with those who, with whom we might have mistrust. Love from the center of who you are. Love from the center of of who you are. Now, Jesus had a little bit of a problem with his disciples. I don't know if y'all, I'm sure you, as you read the Bible study, you realize that, that they didn't always kind of act like, um, like perfect people. You know, y'all, y'all remember that. Uh, James and John argued over whether who was going to have the highest status uh, with Jesus. I'm going to sit on his right hand. No, it's going to be me. I'm going to sit on his right hand. No, you can't do that. And of course, they were, they were brothers and they were kind of always arguing about stuff like that. Um, Peter had a real bad problem uh, with, with Jesus wasting the perfume uh, that, one of the, that a woman had, put, that had, had placed upon him. Uh, and so they are, he argued about that. Uh, and so this keep, keep, keeps on going back and forth. And finally in John, the 13th chapter, uh, they are on their way to Jerusalem and they stop by Bethany, which is the home of who I think was Jesus' best friend, Lazarus. And he had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And so they were in Bethany, and there in Bethany, Jesus gets down on, on a knee and takes the basin and starts to wash Peter's feet, and Peter just gets incensed. You can't do that. No, Lord, you can't do this. That's not your job. Now, notice he wasn't volunteering for it. He just said, no, that's not your job, because that was what the women were supposed to do. Uh, and then eventually he says, no, get, let me do your, do, your, do your feet. But Jesus says no. Um, and this inspires Jesus to look at his disciples who often were were not getting what he was saying to them anyway. He looks at them and he realizes he's got to teach them. And he tells them and lets them in on a secret. He said, I'm not going to be with you much longer. This is before the Last Supper. This is not the Last Supper. I'm, I'm not going to be with you much longer. And he goes and he says, and one of you is going to betray me. And that was the first inkling that the disciples had that there was betrayal in their midst. We hear more about it at the Last Supper, but betrayal in the midst. Judas gets mad and goes off because he knows what he's about to do. And looking at this group of disciples who had argued among themselves at who he knew was going to betray him, who he knew was going to deny him, Jesus looks at them and says, I've got to give them one more shot at understanding what this is all about that we've been doing. So in chapter 13 through chapter 17, uh, Jesus does what's called the discourse of Jesus. He teaches them. But to begin that, he does this. He says, first things first. The only way you can be transformed in this, like Paul said, is you got to first get this new commandment. I give you a new commandment, he says in John 13, 35, that you love one another that you love one another how many have ever heard that before yeah we all heard that right so but we have to be careful because I know how it is we are uh, you know I've lived in the south all my life I get this Uh, we sometimes have uh, we sometimes have a way of saying something without really saying it we say something that might sound good on the outside but inside it doesn't means a different thing anybody ever said to you bless your heart Y'all got it. You get it. Yeah, bless your heart. That's that. I love that. Um, like, oh my goodness, uh, uh, put on a little weight, brother. Bless your heart. Um, uh, and then we have another expression. Uh, I love them to death, but I love them to death, but and then you're going to say something really awful about them. That's not the kind of love Jesus was talking about when he talked about the new commandment. It's easy for us as Christians to say, oh, I'm a Christian, I just love everybody, and not really mean it. And so Jesus threw a little bit of fly in that ointment, if you will, when he says, you got to finish the sentence that Jesus was saying. He says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Ouch. As I have loved you so much that I will die on a cross for you is I have loved you so much that my Father has sent me to bring salvation to this world. I loved you so much. (laughs) And I want you to love each other the same way. That's a hard task. If we're going to be transformed by the renewal of our minds so that we'll know the good and perfect will of God, we've got to learn to love as Jesus has loved us. 
And that's hard. That's hard. It means we have to work. It means being a disciple is not something that we are. It's something that we do. It means we work at loving each other in ways that we never imagined we could love each other before. It means we have to love those who, with whom we disagree, love those with whom we mistrust, love those who have betrayed us, love the, oh my goodness, it means this whole body of things, and we have to love one another as Jesus has loved us. I had a professor uh, in seminary who was my, actually my advisor, Roberta Bondi. She wrote a wonderful book, To Love as God Loves. In that book, she talks a little bit about her own experience. She, her father had abandoned her and had abused her, in fact, it took her a long time to e even be able to say the Lord's Prayer because when she said, uh, Our Father who art in heaven, her concept of a father was someone who mistreated her and abandoned her. Uh, she grew, as an adult, she understood that that was not what the, the whole essence or the, uh, the, the sense of God's presence was for that prayer. And so she prayed that prayer and then went to, seek her, went to seek her father out and forgive him and love him as God has loved her. Wow. What would it mean if in a black swan year, in a black swan world, where everybody seems to be in a bad mood, if we as the followers of Jesus were to love each other and others as much as God has loved us? Now, here's an important point that Jesus makes on his way out. He says to the, to the disciples, he says, and that's how they, all those folks out there, are going to know that you are my disciples by the love you have for each other, for ways you love each other. I get real depressed when I read Pew Research and I read Barna Research and it says, tells me that there's a negative uh, attitude in this world with, uh, with the church. Uh, that, that people in the world seem to, to not go to church as much and they don't want to be a part of the church. And, and so when you look at that research, it's, because, uh, it's not because of anything that, that we might could identify easily. It's the fact that, that most people don't see the church any different than any other institution in the world. Nothing sets us apart. We argue, we fight, we have complaints, we mistrust, we dislike, we love everybody except or but... Jesus said, they will know your disciples when you love each other. Our job as the church this day, our job as Christians is to love each other enough, just like Jesus loved us, that when the world sees us, they know those are disciples. Those are followers of Jesus who are not just identified and tagged, but they are the doers of the word, not just the hearers of the word. John Wesley had the same problem. <laughs> it's kind of, kind, of, kind of funny, actually, um, uh, that John, John Wesley was an interesting guy. 4'11", by the way, he was, he was 4'11". My daughter is 4'11". I can remember taking her to Lake Junaluska where they have a life-size life uh, kind of picture of, of John Wesley on the wall, and she would go and stand because she, she said, oh, I can look at this guy eye to eye. Uh, and, and she still loves the church, too. That's great. I love that. She, she, still, she still sees Wesley eye to eye. But in 1739, Wesley was approached by a group of people who said, we need to know what the rules are for being Methodist. We need to know what the rules are. Uh, my great-grandfather one time told me <laughs> that, that, we, that, uh, that Christians love rules. We, we like rules because we, we want to know what the rules are so we can get to that point where, <laughs> where, where we, we know that we don't have to cross. We can get, move up, bump up against them. We, won't, you know, we can go so far and, and still keep a rule but not quite. Um, in fact, I, I, from that, I, I got this wonderful kind of mantra I used to use when I taught Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, and that was that, that, that when God created this world, when God created human beings, he said, all ever God, God ever wanted us to do was to be God's people, and he would be our God. That's all he wanted from us. You, you, know, you be my people, I'll be your God. That was the covenant. Uh, you, you know, I've created all this for you. You be my people, I'll be your God. You be my family, I'll be your God. <laughs> and so because we could not keep that one covenant, uh, God had to give the nation of Israel ten rules, ten commandments, to keep that one covenant. And because people had a hard time keeping those ten rules, we had to have those 650 uh, Levitical laws to keep those ten rules so we could keep that one covenant. 
And then because we couldn't keep that, they had to be about 3,000 uh, uh, rabbinical, rabbinical laws to keep the Levitical laws so that we could keep the 10 rules so that we could keep the one covenant. And then finally God just said, don't make me come down there. <laughs> but he did in the form of his only son, Jesus Christ, who looks his disciples right in the eye and said, here is the commandment, the new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. John Wesley was so exasperated with them that finally in the fall of 1739, he said, okay, you know, that, you know you're supposed to love each other, right? Well, here are the rules you got to keep. First, do no harm. And they, by the way, these are still the general rules of the church. Uh, do no harm. He's got a whole list of things you shouldn't do. Don't keep slaves. Uh, you know, I, I, one of my, he's a whole list, about 20 of them. My favorite is do not speak evil of magistrates or ministers. I like that. <laughs> that means don't talk about preachers or politicians in evil ways. Lord, forgive us all. Then he says, do no harm. Do good. And he makes a whole list of good things you can do. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Visit the sick and in prison. Makes a whole list of things that you can do. You know, help those that, 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 that are part of, your, of the household of faith. Support them and love them. I mean, he, just, he says, do no harm. Do good. And then in the old language of that, sin, of that time, he says, attend upon the ordinances of, the, of God. Literally what he said was, stay in love with God, which means go to worship. Do family Bible study. Take communion. Do those things that keep you in love with God. All based on the fact that God loved us enough that he sent his son Jesus Christ to this world for our salvation. To bring us into the family. And even though sometimes there are those in our families we don't get along with, we still love them. From the depths of our heart from the center of who we are, we are called to be his disciples, to love as God loves us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. As we go our way this morning, um, I want to ask you to do something very special. I want you to stand up right where you are, just stand as you're able. One of the things I miss most about, about being in worship together is passing the peace. I don't know if y'all used to do that or, or greet each other. Y'all may have done that on Sunday morning. Well, so you can't kind of do that right now, but I want you to kind of turn around and look at folks, as many as you can, and point at them and go like this. <laughs> and when you wave at those persons, uh, Know that that is the love of Christ passing through us. Would you do that with each other just for a moment? Just for that, just for a moment. <laughs> see, see, that wasn't hard, was it? And I can't see if you're smiling behind those, <laughs> those masks or not. But my task as a preacher, is to help you smile not only in your heart, but also across your face. To love someone, I once read, to love someone is to know the song in their heart and to sing it to them when they have forgotten it. The song of our heart is Jesus Christ. As we leave this place this day, go out to sing the song of our hearts to all those that we know so that we can love them truly as God has loved us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go now in peace. Amen and amen. amen.